thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm very pleasantly surprised. I mean, I appreciate the, the turnout for today. And it's a real pleasure to be here at, at the Native American Cultural Center too. I know a lot of people here, Chris and Becky and Stephen. And, and, so it's a lot of fun to be in this part of the state. Um, as uh, Chris mentioned, I'll be talking about my most recent book um, called Something in These Hills, The Culture of Family Land in Southern Appalachia. This was originally a photograph that I wanted as the uh, cover photo for the book, but the press wanted a vertical photo, so I had to choose a different one. But I always like this photo because it encapsulates a lot of what I'm talking about, this connection between family, faith, and um, the mountain landscape. So one of the things that um, puzzles a lot of people is where I came up with the title of, of the book. Um, there's a very famous poem by a Clemson alumnus. It's, everybody knows the poem. Everybody from Clemson knows the poem. Um, it starts out where there's something in these hills. And he talks about the grandeur of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And you know Clemson's relatively close to the Blue Ridge. So that's a good way to describe the beauty of this particular place. And then I was interviewing a couple in way northern Pickens County for the research that I was doing. And um, the gentleman, the, the man that, the, uh, of the couple, who probably hadn't graduated from high school, I wasn't sure of that. I know he went attended grade school, but I don't think he went to, uh, so in other words, I don't think he was real familiar with the Clemson poem. He said, that we were talking about the challenges of living in the mountains. He said, there's always been something in these hills. And then his wife immediately interjected, liquor making, chicken fighting, dope growing. And I remember hearing that quote and I remember thinking that's a really interesting kind of contrast to think about the same physical space, the mountains, in this case, the mountains of South Carolina, the same physical space can be two things at the same time. On the one hand, it can be beautiful and it can be dangerous. And so that was the original theme for my book. I started out thinking about the ambiguity of place and that intrigued me. But then as I started talking to people and listening to what they were saying about the land that they occupied, I thought there was something more. And so I end up with two uh, interrelated research questions. First of all, the one that I started with, how the same landscape can be both beautiful and dangerous at the same time. But then, as I said, I started talking to people and I heard people talking about land in a way that I was not familiar with. I grew up in the Midwest, I grew up in the St. Louis area. So land to me was something that people bought and sold, it was a commodity that had value. But when people in the upstate, people that I was talking to were talking about land, land had more of a personal connection to them. There was this emotional tie to family land that people were telling me in the words that they used and the metaphors that they used and it took me a while to figure that out. So then I thought, and that's my second theme, is this, the cultural process by which um, family land symbolically becomes part of one's family. And then maybe how are those two eyes, ideas connected? So here's a state you guys are familiar with. This is the uh, three county area that I'm focusing on way up in the Northern part of the state. I guess you guys are down here someplace. Not even sure where I am now. <laughs> More specifically, uh, the three counties of Oconee, Pickens, and Greenville, and then the northern part of those three counties. I'm a cultural anthropologist, not a historian, nothing wrong with that, but bless their hearts. I'm a cultural anthropologist. So I want to talk to people, living people, to get their perspective of their world, to get their worldview. I began this project in 2007. Um, I had a lot of other things going on at the same time. Everybody says, what took you so long to do this? Well, as my academic colleagues will tell you, there's a lot of other things that we academics have to do. I did most of the interviews between 2008 and 2012. Then people say, well, what took you so long to write this book? Well, I did a, another book first. I got sidetracked um, by I discovered an enclave of African-Americans in Northern Pickens County, the descendants of freed slaves still living in this African-American um, tiny little community called Liberia. And so I thought somebody needs to tell the oral history of this African-American enclave and its relationship to the state, the state's history and US history. So that's the first book that I wrote. Um, then I got back to this one. Um, as a cultural anthropologist, I wanna talk to people. I wanna get their perspective on things. 
So I interviewed approximately 89, well, no, probably 89 people ranging from their early 20s, college students, all the way up into their 90s. Um, unfortunately, about 20% have passed away. I tried to do a broad sample, talk to males and females, Euro and African Americans, didn't meet any Native Americans, not in that particular area. Um, as a cultural anthropologist, the two primary methods of uh, research that I do, ethnographic interviewing, where I'm asking people to tell me their own points of view and trying to elicit their points of view. The other major um, um, uh, methodology that we use is participant observation, where I try to watch what people are doing as well as listen to what they're doing. To document both of those two books, plus the third one that I'm doing, um, um, about 144 recorded hours of interviews, a thousand pages of transcripts. And so um, I've collected a lot of information, let's put it that way. So that's the reason why I'm two books, plus hopefully a third. Um, one of the distinct, one of the, the um, reviewers, of course, when you write a book manuscript, you send it out to reviewers, the reviewers send back all kinds of things wrong with the book. So you have to respond to the reviewers comments several times sometimes. But one of the reviewers early on in the, the, um, uh, the process of, of publishing asked me to differentiate between uh, people who live in the upstate and people who live in sorry, people who live in this part of South Carolina and people who have lived there for multiple generations. And the reviewer argued that the reason why that's an important distinction to make is that sometimes people who may have deep family ties to family land may not live on family land anymore, or maybe they just recently moved back, they haven't lived there for a long time, and yet they still consider themselves to be connected to that place. On the other hand, there's people like me who've lived there for over 30 something years and I don't feel that same connection to family land. So how do we differentiate between those two? So I tried to come up with a term that sort of captured the meaning of those two different kinds of presence, let's put it that way. So I use the term resonance to describe people who live in some of the gated communities that I talk to, people who maybe think of that place as home they pay taxes there, they live there, they, they've spent you know, decades there, they vote there, they're lo locally connected. Those are residents. At the same time, people who have multiple generational ties to family land, I consider them to be, I call them inhabitants to try to differentiate between the two. So you'll see those two terms um, um, interplayed in the, the presentation. So I'm going to start out with the, the with the um, um, perspectives of the residents, the people who have lived there maybe decades, but don't have that deep tie to family land. So, and again, remember my first theme was the ambiguity of place. How can the same place be both beautiful and dangerous at the same time? I was playing with the words majestic and menacing. I like the alliteration of those two words. And so that's one of the sort of the elements to this ambiguity of place. But the other contributing factor, the ambiguity of place is, as those of you who have known something about, looked at the Appalachian literature, the Appalachians especially, the Appalachians have been described in multiple ways over multiple decades. A lot of it's tied to the politics or the economics of the time, whether hillbillies are positive force in the nation or negative force in the nation. So you end up with this not only ambiguity of place geographically, but also an ambiguity of place socially. So Southern Appalachians, for example, have been described as a frontier, um, a place where the United States generally is extracting resources or and, and um, um, 20, you know, sorry, um, 200 years ago, it was a frontier as the European Americans pushed African uh, Native Americans off the place. So it's always been kind of sort Welcome of my Zoom meeting. and then at the same time, I think maybe I'm too close to I'm getting some feedback um, at the same time. Appalachian historians, Appalachian scholars have also used this similar kind of ambiguity to describe the place, too. It's been described as inhabited by yesterday's people, people who sort of time forgot. Or at the same time, it's been described as people living there as our contemporary ancestors, meaning there's this great glorious white Anglo-Saxon race that originally populated the United States and everybody else is an interloper, which of course made my African-Americans as well as Native Americans feel very uncomfortable. So I like to play with this natural contradiction. So this is a sign 
for the Chattooga River, which forms the boundary between Georgia and South Carolina. And you notice even the sign, the nature sign, describes it as a natural contradiction. Oops. Oh yeah, you guys can see that. Um, the river, uh, peaceful, uh, uh, calm, peaceful recreational experience can be a dangerous and disastrous than it is. And if you've ever floated in the Chattooga, you know what they're talking about. So again, that ambiguity of place. So a little bit about, um, a little bit of detail. Um, the Chattooga River, this is a scene from the Chattooga River. Chattooga River can be both beautiful and dangerous. And a really good film, I think, that captures the ambiguity of place. If, if most of my undergraduates aren't familiar with deliverance, but you get that real sense of the danger of the place, right? So this is from Burt Reynolds' autobiography. Um, Burt Reynolds described the Chattooga River as I can put this thing down here. Oh, darn it. Sorry, I got to go back. Pardon me. I'm trying to get this screen down. Well, I'm going to have to read from the slide. Burt Reynolds, is, Burt Reynolds is in Deliverance, of course, described the Chattooga River from Deliverance as 50 miles of whitewater hell and deadly waterfalls, second most dangerous river in the US. Every day we get lunch out of paper bags on the riverbank. Oh, how can I get rid of that? Because once you start it down, you can't go back up again, is what he said. How can I get rid of that black bar? I'm sorry. This one that's also from the very bottom of the slide. Technical difficulty, sorry. You want to go back? Yeah, we have to go back again. Hide panel. Did I see that? Hide video panel. How's that? No. Chris, this is Claudia. Uh, in the uh, online audience, we can see the the whole panel, um, the the very bottom line. By they the way, they can't see it here, though. I'll continue on, and we'll just have to. I think I know what the slides say. Sorry, you can't if you can't read them. All right, so Chattooga River natural dangers. Oh. Another source of danger, of course, comes from the inhabitant. I'm sorry, the the people there. Um, this is actually, actually it's burned down as we just, um, arson was suspected, but, but this is a locally very well-known place, um, in Northern Pickens County called Bob's Place. And I was talking to, um, I was talking to, I'm going to be off camera, I know, sorry. I was talking to, um, some of the people in, um, one of the gated communities. And so the, uh, lady that I was talking to was actually describing this place. And she said, but we say South Carolina and there's an image like rednecks, motorcycles. I was a little afraid to go into this place that she's talking about, but we, it's, I'll explain why it was called scatterbrains later. But we went inside because we are pioneers, right? Place is absolutely filthy. And all of a sudden all these bikers come up and they have Confederate headbands on. So she's talking about, again, a dangerous place because of the people, but you also notice and I highlighted it in red, you also notice how she said, she calls herself pioneers. So this is a woman living in a gated community, surrounded by, of course, manicured, manicured um, grounds. But by describing herself as a pioneer, again, that reflects, re relates back to that frontier kind of mentality that we talked about before. So the, the metaphor is the people in these gated communities are pioneers pushing into a wilderness. Of course, people have been living there for thousands of years, if you consider Native Americans, too. At the same time, of course, people recognize the natural beauty. And so she's talking about um, uh, this is a gated community shot. So she's talking about, you look out on that lake and think, geez, God, thank you. Not only for your creativity, but for allowing us to enjoy it and to be stewards of it. We don't want to burn and cut down the trees and kill all the animals, we enjoy them. Yeah, there is a sense of danger, I don't notice that contrast, in going out in your backyard and seeing Bart the bear, but the joy of sitting on your back porch and watching the big Carolina moon is what she says. Huge Carolina moon. It's gone on mine. It's unfortunately still in yours. Maybe it'll disappear eventually. We can pray it away. Oops. Another thing that I noticed that people um, uh, here in the gated communities talked about was a sense of community that they developed amongst themselves, but it wasn't the same kind of a sense of community that inhabitants felt. 
So here they are talking about their neighbors. We never wanted to know our neighbors where they lived elsewhere. But once they moved here in the upstate of South Carolina, it was so different when we moved here. She says, we're just like one big happy family. And I think that that is mainly because we are all out here in the middle of nowhere. And most of our activities are centered right here. So their sense of community comes from the kinds of things that they do together within their gated community. That's their sense of community, not the same sense of community that, that resident, the long-term inhabitants have. But the other thing you'll notice, and again, I highlight that in yellow, you notice that she describes herself or they describe their community as out here in the middle of nowhere. Again, think about that pioneer frontier kind of mentality. Of course, they're not out there in the middle of nowhere. They're surrounded by thousands and thousands of people. But at the same time, it's that ambiguity of place that uh, continues on. Another thing that I noticed from local people is they were very interested in the history of the area, but it wasn't the same kind of family history that the inhabitants had. So people are talking about the, the older history, you know, we know more about this area, we probably know about our area at home, and I don't know why. The whole Cherokee history is pretty fascinating. More history I can read about, reading about how the lake was formed with Duke Power and Kiwi and the Indians around here, it's exciting. You notice though that none of that history includes relatively recent history of the people who prior to being displaced by the lakes had lived there for generations. So they're interested in old history, Native American maybe and, and uh, early colonial, and then relatively recent history, what happened when Duke Power put the lakes in, but in between, kind of ambiguous. Another thing that I noticed people talking about was they're described that as residents, talking about land, but it was more of a way that I think about land. Land is a commodity that you buy and sell. So they're talking about one of the interviewers that I said, uh, no question about it, classic agri philosophy, what the land gives, you take and you give back. And then the next season, you do the same thing all over again. It's all about the land. So he recognizes that people are connected to the land. But again, is it the same way that the inhabitants felt? We could really understand when people were coming from when they came into this community because we're the ones coming in, building and taking over their land. So they're aware of the fact that, yeah, people used to live here, but again, there's not that deep connection um, to land. So what have I learned or what did I learn about residents' perspectives? First of all, the area is ambiguous. They consider the area to be both dangerous and beautiful at the same time. Again, both the place and the people. Sense of community is formed by activity with others in your particular um, private area. We're interested in regional history, but again, it's not personalized. There's no kind of deep connection to physical space. And that land is a commodity that's valued for its utility and beauty. Again, like we typically think about land. On the other hand, inhabitants see things differently. Let's put it that way. They also recognize the landscape can be very beautiful. And so this is a woman telling me the water, the mountains, the trees, everything, it's kind of separate and apart. It's one of my favorite places on earth to go. No, this is actually, this is a male. It smelled different and it looked different and it felt different. It's a pretty primitive feeling. Notice how the landscape is sensorily experienced. He's talking about land smelling in a certain way. He's talking about not only how it looked different, and also there's this experiential feeling of land. And then this is the um, woman's um, quote. There's something special about mountains to me. It's like I'm home. I have a special curve up there on the mountain. She's talking actually about this valley that I've always been enchanted with. In June, when the rhododendron bloom in there, it looks like snow falling because there are all those lovely white blooms. And when it snows, it's a wonderland to me, just perfection. Notice the detail that she notices in her land. At the same time, um, residents recognize, I mean, inhabitants recognize that it can be dangerous. I got to apologize for this quote. It's very gruesome. I wanted to sort of demonstrate the danger that people recognize. So my apologies um, for the quote, but it was from a um, um, rafter guide on the Chituga. Worst was a kayaker that drowned and left crack on the Chattooga River and he was swimming upstream. So he dropped into it backwards, immediately broke his back, had to feet. And then when they were pulling him out, he came out in pieces. Yes, it's pretty dramatic. 
People also recognize, inhabitants also recognize that it's a dangerous landscape because yes, there are animals that live up there that sometimes don't like humans. So this is a husband wife that I was interviewing. Uh, she said, um, I actually, I think it's both both are quotes from her. I've always felt more safe here than I would living in town. I mean, we've had bear on our porch and in our yard, snakes maybe, snakes in the summertime. And then his wife added, I'm not too worried about the bear, but when our daughter was little, we put our swing set where it is for that reason. I didn't want to be in here fixing supper and her outside playing too far from the house, having a bear take away their daughters that she's talking about. It's also a dangerous landscape. People recognize, inhabitants recognize, yeah, there's some interesting people up here that you just want to avoid. So there's that actually, that's an actual road sign. Um, I like the, the crossbars and the O's there. And then there's that quote again, there's always been something in these hills, no matter how far you go, there's always something in the hills, liquor making, chicken fighting, dope growing. And then this is that other quote about the uh, inhabitant who went to that same place. It's called scatterbrains because the idea was he would scatter your brains if you messed up. So he's talking about the exact same place, Bob's place that I showed you a few minutes ago. Now he, the owner, was a character. I am telling you, you remember Gunsmoke? Well, one day they said Scatter was standing there, had his gun in the holster. Well, when Matt Dillon drew his gun, Scatter pulled his out and shot the TV. And he said, I told you I could outdraw Matt Dillon. I heard a lot of stories about Scatter brains. It's also, inhabitants recognize it's also a dangerous place because of illegal substances. That's an actual street sign. Sugar liquor, of course, is a type of Mountain Dew. Um, uh, Mountain. So this is a, a man telling me, it was just a family tradition for us. My daddy had three stills going here at one time. I was a watchman for them. When he was a kid, I walked the woods with a shotgun. It wasn't much pay, but back then 50 cents was good pay. And then this next quote, I think, nicely illustrates the transition from liquor making to dope growing. Alvin was a bootlegger, started growing marijuana. And he sold his marijuana in quarts and half a gallons because he didn't know nothing about grams and ounces. All he ever knew was quarts and half a gallons like in liquor. And that's the way he sold his marijuana. It's also a dangerous landscape because there's supernatural uh, um, inhabitants there. So boogers, of course, are, are haunts, are, are um, ghosts. And that's an actual road sign in Upper Pickens County. So it's an interview with them, that same couple. When we first bought a house on their property, some people said it was a haunted house. And one time when their daughter was little, we were down there and she wanted to know who that lady was that walked by. She saw something that nobody else saw. We had about a hundred pound solid white boxer who would attack anything and he wouldn't go in the house. He'd get in the door and he'd start shaking, just trembling. And you could kick him in the tail or throw him in there and he'd turn around and run out just as fast as you could. So it's both, and it's an ambiguous place, both to residents and to inhabitants. But as I said, inhabitants are talking about land in a different sort of way. And so I started thinking about and began to analyze how is it exactly that people become connected to the land that they occupy? So I kind of broke it down into a series of steps. One of the ways that people become connected to places that they inhabit for a long period of time is by putting names on those places. So this is a woman telling me a popular thing to do is to go for a walk or hike. We had no car, but most of the places we walked to was just to see them because daddy had told us about them. The trees, streams, and even the fields and footpaths all had a story behind them. And they all had names, some of which we thought were funny. So by walking through the landscape, you learn the history of that landscape. Another way that people are connected to land is by building structures from stuff on their land whether it's clay to make bricks, whether it's wood to make buildings. Again, physically connected to that place. Grandmother, she was raised right here at this old walnut tree and she drove the nails out of that lumber and stuff when they moved it up here, the house. And they built that house and lived in it till they died. They said them bricks was made right there. She's not talking about that particular house, but I like the house to illustrate that, that particular idea. Now, the way that people become connected to land, inhabitants become connected to land is by using that land for a livelihood. More than farming, more than timbering, there's other ways that people can use landscape. Probably shouldn't say it here, but yes, pot hunting was also mentioned to me occasionally. <clears throat> so again, medicinal herbs can be um, collected from national park or um, forest service land or private land. 
this yellow root, which was used in medicinal name. My dad used to go out and dig grub root in the woods, ship it off, star grass, ginseng, and he'd sell that for so much a pound. And we used to break ivy. Her daddy bought a brand new Jeep pickup and paid for it from breaking ivy. We done anything to make a dollar. Then there you can see this is from the Pickens County um, flea market. Yellow root, a dollar a bunch. That's yellow root down there in that side. You can see it's literally yellow, hence the name. But bohog root, you have to ask for it. Bohog root is a um, aphrodisiac and it was sold under the counter. So you have to ask for it, which I thought was pretty cool. Another way that it happens to become connected to land is by owning family land for multiple generations. So this is a, um, a family home in upstate South Carolina. And this is a quote from a man. I still own an acre and a half of the original family land from the late 1700s. But it means something to me to be able to go out there and grow a garden on that land that I know my father worked and my grandfather and my great grandfather going back five or six generations. So it's not land I ever intend to part with, but I hope to pass on to my son so he can continue it. And this is from another man. It's hard to find a piece of property now because if a family owns it, they don't want to sell it. Money is not everything. Sometimes you've got to have values above money. Again, thinking about land in a non-commercial way was unusual to me. Inhabitants also connect to land through occupying the same landscape generation after generation after generation. I was born, born right out here, out on this hill. And we lived up on the hill there until my daddy built this house, the one that he lives in now. Everyone lives here. I got five grandkids up the hill here. Youngest grandson wants his own place here. My oldest was wanting that up there on top of the hill. And the oldest granddaughter, she's wanting to go to put her double wide in up here in this patch of woods right here above us. Everybody's living right close to that same. That's why you see those clusters of trailers in the upstate. Another way that people are connect, inhabitants are connected to land is by remembering things that happen on that land generation after generation after generation. This is what somebody told me. I can live anywhere else, but there'd always be a special thing about coming back here to the mountains. And we, she and her sister, just walked all over the home place and it just brought back memories of when we lived there. This is where mama always had her garden. And you know, it's good to go back sometimes and just say, this is where I was raised. This was some of my property. Another way that inhabitants become connected to land is they literally are embedded in that same landscape. Literally embedded in that landscape. My great, 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 great grandmother was one of the first white settlers in the valley. Her grave is on Graveyard Hill right next to uncle so-and-so's house. There's family there, buried there. I wouldn't mind being buried here when my time comes. That would be the place to be, looking down on this beautiful valley forevermore. People, and have, because of this connection to landscape, this multi-tiered connection to landscape, inhabitants scent the land in a different way than most of the rest of us would. One of my favorite memories and smells and feelings right now is, you know, I can close my eyes and know what it feels like to walk through fresh plowed soil when it's hot outside, but the dirt's cold between your toes and the way that it smells. So, you know, the smell and the feel of all that. Notice that sensory connection that people have. It translates also into a spiritual connection. I've tried to talk about sense of place for me, why the people are important and why relationships are important and the land and this valley and the mountains. So when I try to think about these people that were uprooted, they lost their land because of the lakes, it was because it was a part of them. And that's what I feel when I'm here. That sense of place that I have is not dependent on amenities, house, people, or relationships. It's a relationship to, I would say, creation. Notice that land is a part of them. Because land connects so intimately with people, land anthropomorphizes. People's inhabitants talk about land as if it were alive. There's something about the serenity and the peace. She's talking about this place. It's just overpowering. You can't explain it. You have to feel it. 
And when you break around that little curve right there near her home, I take a moment, that whole area, she's talking about the Blue Ridge that you see in the background, that whole area just opens up its arms and just hugs me. She's anthropomorphized that landscape. That landscape hugs her metaphorically. Because of that metaphorical connection with people, land merges with people. Well, it's in, it's my heart. Notice that she's saying, it's, land is my heart, it's my home. The two things are intimately connected. There's so much that holds me in my heart here. Family history, my family's still living here, a wonderful community, the beauty of it all. If you just go out and sit and look at the landscape, you can't help but be touched by it in some fashion. It's a spiritual thing for me. Again, she's anthropomorphized the landscape. To me, it's beautiful. She's talking about her home place. It's a restful place. I can walk out on the deck and see the sunrise, listening to the birds and listening to the ripple of the water. You can't buy that. That's in your bones. Land has become, that connection to land has become a part of her in that case. Because of that deep, intimate connection that people have with the land that their occupant happens to have with the land that they occupy, imagine what it would feel like if land has anthropomorphized to be literally a part of your, metaphorically a part of your family. Imagine then what it feels like to lose that land because of the lakes, like Kiwi, like Jokasi, artificial lakes. People lived underneath well, on the land and that's now covered by those lakes. So I interviewed people who lost their land. That's a highway going into now um, Upper Lake Kiwi that um, used to be into down into a, a beautiful valley. A lot of people didn't want to move at all. And a lot of them people moved and died. And then he emphasized again, he said again, they moved out of there and died, emphasizing that. They didn't, none of them live, I don't believe it was near one of them that lived five years that come out of that Jocassi Valley. They didn't want to move. It, and then somebody else said at a later time, it was the only home they'd ever known. It was their life. Everything they had was wrapped up in that and they were uprooted from it. They were given new houses by due power. They were given all these material things and the spiritual things weren't there anymore. And so one of the things I noticed is that people talked about is having been forced to give up land, a lot of people collected things from that landscape that no longer exist, flowers, rocks, bushes, and I thought of that as sort of metaphorically like how people would, would hold the lock of a hair of a loved one who's passed away or some, a memento from a loved one who's passed away. I sort of thought of that kind of connection that maybe that's another reason why people were saving these tiny bits of remembrances of a family member now lost. So there's a woman talking about, and that's by the way, that's uh, Oconee Bell, that rare flower up there. In my backyard up here is a red honeysuckle. My mother brought that out of Jocassi Valley. And also she brought Oconee Bell, and that's Oconee Bell. There was a whole mountainside just across the river from my grandparents' home. And there are old roses here that she brought from the valley. So she's bringing flowers back out of the valley. So summarizing the inhabitant perspectives, land again is both beautiful and dangerous, but for inhabitants, land animates. It becomes alive. It becomes, it, it, it has this sense of animation to it. Because it's animated, it becomes like a family member. And we all have family members, some of them are preferred perhaps over others. So family members also are ambiguous, right? They can be good and bad. And therefore that's the connection to those two kinds of ideas. Because family land, because land becomes like a family member, family land is maintained, defended, and memorialized. So I wanted to try, I shouldn't have that up there yet. I wanted to kind of put this idea into some kind of way. That was kind of the goal of the book is how can I put into words the emotions that people feel, the inhabitants feel about their land? So this is how I summarize the book. And I'm talking about this particular image. More than beauty and more than utility, the something in these hills is the memory of a host of generations of relatives passing through that landscape and merging with that landscape, like the roots of this tree flowing over and through this rock. This is a synthesis between animate and inanimate entities that is very difficult for inhabitants to articulate, but it is an experiential feeling that others can now better understand. 
Thank you very much for the opportunity.